Hi everyone, and thanks for watching. My name is Greg Vaughn. I'm a research scientist at the USGS Astrogeology Science Center here in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I also work for the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. And I'm really excited to share with you some work that I've been doing in Yellowstone for the last couple of years that is associated with a new thermal area that has recently appeared. The work that I'm gonna be talking about is focused on one area that's in this photograph right here. It's focused on this area right here. And one of the interesting things about this area right here is that 20 years ago, it looked like this, okay? It was healthy, thick forest full of lodgepole pine trees. And uh, I could ask you, what do you think this is? But I'm afraid the title of my talk sort of gives that away. But there are other really interesting questions we can ask about it. Like, um, when did this first appear? How long has it been sneaking up on us? And how did I find it? And how long, uh, you know, how did I miss it before? And uh, another really important question is, you know, what, what, what could have caused this to appear? And what does it all mean with respect to uh, the Yellowstone thermal system? So the first thing I want to do is step back a little bit and, and we'll take a look at Yellowstone Park as a whole. First of all, if you've never been there, um, it's a beautiful place. You should, you should go to Yellowstone if you ever get a chance to. It's an amazing place. It's in the northwest corner of Wyoming. And uh, this, this uh, map on the left is a map of, the, of, of Yellowstone Park, uh, the whole park. It's a very big place. It's about 90 kilometers from east to west and about 100 kilometers uh, north to south tall. So if you, ever dare, if you ever do get a chance to go there, um, plan to spend some time because it's a really big park and there's a lot, a lot of things to see inside the park. Now this map shows a whole lot of things. Um, one of the things it shows is topography in the park. The gray scale color in the background shows where the hills and the valleys are um, and the mountains in the park. And the other thing it shows is some of the lakes, some of the larger lakes in the park are shown in blue on this map. And I'm also showing some of the geologic features in the park. This uh, dark black line here is the rim of the Yellowstone caldera, which is the caldera that collapsed after the last really big super eruption, which happened about 631,000 years ago. And this black dashed line on the inside of that is sort of this inner concentric ring fracture zone, which is also associated with the, the collapse of the caldera. And um, a lot of things have happened since the last super eruption and the formation of this Yellowstone caldera. Uh, there have been dozens of volcanic eruptions since then that have mostly filled in the caldera with more lava flows and lava domes such that the caldera is no longer a big hole in the ground. It's almost all filled in. And another, another thing that's happened is that as the magma below has recharged and re, refilled this reservoir of magma, there are a couple of places where the, the ground is bulging back up. And these are called resurgent domes. And there's a place called the Mallard Lake Dome and over here, the Sour Creek Dome. And these are places where the, the, the magma at depth five to 10 kilometers down is pushing, pushing the ground back up. Now, the reason I show these geologic features is because they're really important in understanding where all the thermal areas are. And that's what I'm showing on this map in shades of red. That's where all the thermal areas are. So um, many of you probably know that Yellowstone is probably most famous for all of its thermal features. It has thousands of thermal features that are spread out over the park. There are hot springs and geysers and uh, fumaroles or hot, hot gas vents and mud pots. And uh, there are just thousands of them all over the park, but they tend to be clustered together into zones we call thermal areas. So a thermal area is, is an area with a bunch of thermal features, and it also has hydrothermal mineral deposits on the ground and hydrothermal alteration of the rocks and the soils beneath. They also tend to be hot, radiating a lot of heat, giving off a lot of magmatic gases like water vapor and carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. And they also tend to be pretty barren of vegetation. Uh, vegetation is not happy growing in these places. Um, it's too hot and, the, and the, the soil is too acidic in a lot of cases. And so they tend to be pretty devoid of vegetation. And so that's what it's, it's on this map in, in, in uh, red. Now, the Yellowstone Center for Resources is one of the research groups inside the National Park Service. They're located at, at park headquarters and um, they maintain a database map of all of the thermal features and all the thermal areas in Yellowstone. And this map is, um, it's a work in progress, partly because it's such a big area. There are a lot of places that we haven't really explored and characterized in great detail yet. Um, there are still things to be found that we haven't found yet. 
And the other reason this map is a, is a work in progress is because change is the rule in Yellowstone. Things are always changing. This, this hydrothermal system is, is very dynamic. And um, I'm going to show you an example of that in just, in just a few minutes. So one of the things that I do for the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory in collaboration with the National Park Service is I sit in my office and I look at my computer screen and I look at satellite thermal infrared images of Yellowstone National Park and I try to use this information to map out where all the hot zones are and help and I use this information to help assess and update where all the thermal areas and the thermal features are in the park. So a couple of years ago, I was sitting in my office looking at this Landsat 8 thermal infrared image that was acquired during the nighttime on April uh, 20th, 2017. And uh, on this particular occasion, I was looking very closely at this area right here, which is on the um, north east side of the Sour Creek Dome. It's an area where there are a few thermal areas that have been mapped and there are a few little lakes there. And I noticed something odd. I noticed this patch of bright pixels. Now in a thermal infrared image, bright pixels are areas that are warmer and dark pixels are areas that are colder. So on this map, you can see I have a few lakes identified here and I have a few thermal areas that are shown in red. Okay. And there's the, this is the Turn Lake thermal area. And this is the Fern Lake thermal area um, named by, named after the nearby lakes. Um, now, in the, in, in, this, in the winter time in Yellowstone and in the early spring, almost all of the lakes in Yellowstone are frozen solid. And they stay frozen pretty much through May. But if there are any lakes that receive warm waters from nearby hot springs or underwater vents, they will either not completely freeze in the winter or they will start to thaw out earlier than the other lakes do in the spring. So you can see here White Lake is still completely frozen, but this western extension of Turn Lake right here is starting to thaw out, just as there are some warm areas inside Fern Lake that are starting to thaw out as well. So I'm looking at this and I see, I see that the thermal areas, the previously mapped thermal areas match up with warm spots, except for this spot right here. And so my first thought was, well, maybe it's a lake that just hasn't been mapped in. And so to answer that question, I, I turned to some high resolution airborne images, color air photo images that were acquired in the same year, 2017. And you can see from this image on the right that this is not a lake. This is a patch of ground, barren of vegetation. It's got a bunch of dead, recently fallen trees, bright white soil. It looks just like uh, another thermal area in the region. And so I, I thought, great, this is a, a thermal area that we, that we haven't mapped yet. I'm going to go ahead and add it to the database. Everyone will be so happy. And then, and then I, I thought, I wonder why no one mapped it before. Surely I couldn't have been the first person to see this. I wonder if uh, it hasn't always been there. So I decided to, to investigate. I wonder how long it's been there. So I started looking at previous uh, year's images, previous images of this thermal area um, to, see, to see if I could figure out when it started. And so here's an image from 2017, of, which is pretty much what it looks like now. And I found an image from 2015 of the same area. Again, here's the previously mapped Turn Lake thermal area in red. And this is the new area that we're looking at. And in 2015, it looked pretty much the same. If we go back in time to 2012, it's a little bit different, maybe a little bit smaller, not quite as bright white soil there. If we go back to 2009, it's definitely different. It's definitely smaller. And you can see more trees in the area that are not falling down, but they're starting to brown and, and uh, and, and become stressed. And if we go back to 2006, there's a big difference. There's just a little area of barren of vegetation here. And also up here, there's a patch of no vegetation and then just browning trees around it. If we go back to 2003, it's even smaller. Again, you can see that patch of, of barren ground there and there with just a few brown trees there. There's an image from 2002, which is kind of difficult to interpret because it's a color infrared photograph. Uh, this before digital photographs were used, and, and you can see the, the patch of, of barren ground there and there. And the earliest image I could find was a uh, black and white air photo from 1994, which shows that this was just forest back in 1994. So sometime between 1994 and 2002, something happened here that started killing the trees and um, heat started coming up and, and, and this thermal area grew. So in order to figure out when, I had to dig deeper into some more satellite remote sensing images to see if I could figure out um, when this started to appear. 
And so uh, I found some, uh, in, in some of the satellite data archives, I found some images from the late 90s. The image on the left is an image from a French commercial a satellite sensor called SPOT, uh, which was acquired in 1998. And the image on the right is a Landsat 7 image from, from 1999. And these images are um, colored using a, uh, a false color composite, which is designed to enhance vegetation. Now, to, to the human eye, vegetation is green because it reflects mostly green light and absorbs more red and blue light. Now, vegetation is very reflective in the near-infrared, just beyond what our eye can see in the, in, the, in the red part of the spectrum. Now, these satellite sensors have channels throughout the visible and the near-infrared. And so what I've done here is I've used a channel that's in the near-infrared to drive the green color of this composite image so that vegetation in these images is really bright green, really intensely green. Areas that are barren of vegetation uh, and highly reflective are bright white, and areas where vegetation is starting to die or decay or become stressed and turn brown are sort of pinkish to brownish in color, okay? So that uh, hopefully explains uh, what the, why these images look the way they do. And here are a couple of more satellite images from the Aster satellite that were acquired in the year 2000 and the year 2001. And here, I believe, is the first hint of evidence that we can see where the trees are starting to become stressed in this area. This pinkish brownish spot right here is exactly where that first area of barren vegetation starts to appear in this area. So, so um, you know, and this, this is arguable, but I believe this is the first hint of evidence we have that this thermal area is starting to appear and stress the trees on the ground. So what I did was I went out and I grabbed all of the remote sensing data sets that I could find uh, for which I could estimate the area of this new growing thermal area and plot that on a graph. And so that's what I've sh shown plotted here in these triangles in the bottom of this graph. It started around the year 2000. It grew very, very slowly. And then around the year 2005, it started to grow very rapidly until the year 2012. And then it sort of, sort of slowed down and didn't grow very much after that. It sort of stabilized after that, okay? And um, that's the new thermal area. In the circles on this, on this graph, I'm showing the area, the surface area over time of this previously mapped thermal area. And so this, this, this previously mapped area has been there for decades. And it pretty much was the same size until about the year 2009. After 2009, it also grew a little bit. There was an increased uh, area in, in tree kills on the top side, the north side of this um, thermal area after 2009. So that's kind of interesting as well. Definitely some changes going on over here. And so the next question I wanted to answer was, what about the thermal output? How much heat is coming out of the ground here? And how has that changed with time? So I grabbed all the, the remote sensing data sets I could find that had thermal infrared images that I could uh, use to derive the temperature and heat output of this area, and I plotted that heat output versus time. And again, the triangles on the bottom part of this plot show the new thermal area. It started to appear around 2000, but it wasn't really that hot. It didn't really start heating up until 2004, 2005. And then it definitely increased significantly in the amount of heat it was outputting until the year 2012. And then it started to stabilize and it didn't really heat up much, much more past that. And so that's consistent with the observations I made in the, the size of the area as well. It went through this period of slow growth and then from 2005 to 2012, a period of pretty rapid growth. And then since then it's sort of stabilized uh, it may have even cooled off a little bit since then. So um, that's kind of an interesting story, I think. And the next big question is, what could have caused this? What could have caused this to happen? Well, in Yellowstone, there are a lot of natural geophysical processes going on that, that potentially could affect the way the hydrothermal system works. In Yellowstone, there's, there's, a, there's a, a hydrothermal system underground that, that relies on geologic fractures and open spaces in order for the fluids to be moving around. And in some cases, these fluids can make it up to the surface and present at the surface as you know, thermal areas. And so uh, it's possible and even likely that earthquakes, which happen frequently in Yellowstone, and ground deforming, bulging and moving up and down in Yellowstone, can create new fractures and new cracks underground. And there are many examples throughout the history of Yellowstone of, of earthquakes and ground deformation being associated with the dynamic thermal system 
at the surface. And so let's take a look at earthquakes. One thing that happens in Yellowstone a lot is earthquakes, okay? On average, Yellowstone has anywhere between about 1,000 to 3,000 earthquakes every year. So if you look at this map, this is a map showing all the earthquakes in Yellowstone from 1994 through 2019. There are more than 40,000 earthquakes. It's amazing. But most of these earthquakes are much too small to be felt, much too small to be doing any damage at the surface. Um, these, these happen you know, almost constantly and, and, and nobody knows about them because they're, they're so small. But it is theoretically possible for, a, for an earthquake, if it were placed in just the right spot, um, even a small one, it could theoretically, the ground shaking could theoretically open up some, some fractures underground and create new conduits for the hydrothermal fluids to be moving through and possibly even make it up to the surface. So could it have been uh, some anomalous earthquake activity that caused this thing to happen? Let's take a look at the data. What I'm showing on the plot in the upper right is the number of annual earthquakes each year. And as you can see in the black bars, uh, there are anywhere between about a thousand and, and a few years. There, there are three years actually where there's a spike of more than 3,000 earthquakes in a given year. That happened in 1999, 2010, and in 2017. But none of those park-wide spikes and earthquakes really line up in time with the onset of this new thermal area or the, the, uh, the, the, the evolution of it, the, 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 the change in phase from slow to rapid to slow again. Um, and, and the other point is most of these earthquakes were located on the western side of the park in, in swarms associated with tectonic faults. And they were much too far away from our, from our, from our area of interest to have really uh, affected this area. Now, let's, if we zoom in and take a look at just the earthquakes that have happened in this region, that's what I'm showing on this map in the lower, lower right. Now, the interesting thing about this area is it's relatively quiet in terms of earthquakes. From 1997 into 2001, there were no earthquakes in this area at all within five kilometers of this thermal area. But 2009 was a very interesting year. In the early 2000s, there were a few earthquakes, but in 2009, there was a little mini swarm of more than 35 earthquakes that all occurred within a two-day period in January 2009. But January 2009 happens right in the middle of that phase where the thermal area was growing really, really rapidly. So it couldn't have caused that phase to start. And that period of rapid growth continued for another couple of years after that spike in earthquakes. So it's very difficult to, to justify saying that the earthquakes had anything to do with this new thermal area. So what about ground deformation? Let's take a look at some data that we have for ground deformation. In Yellowstone, the surface of Yellowstone is moving up and down. It's going through cycles of ground deformation all the time. It's going up, it's going down very slowly. Uh, and we're talking about centimeters, millimeters to centimeters of, of motion here over, over the course of months to years. Um, and we monitor ground deformation in Yellowstone with a series of about 15 permanent GPS stations that are placed in key locations throughout the park. And they're constantly there, they're permanently there measuring millimeter scale movements, north, south, east, west, and up and down movements of the ground surface. And the GPS station that's closest to our area of interest is a place called the White Lake Station. It's located less than three kilometers away from this new, this newly emerging thermal area. And these, this plot on the right, shows the elevation data associated with this, with this um, monument. And what we see here is these data go back to the year 2001. They don't, they, we don't have any data from before that, unfortunately. But there are other methods that we use to assess ground changes in Yellowstone. There are, uh, there are techniques for using satellite radar data to measure ground uh, elevation changes. And there are also field leveling survey data that we can use to assess how the ground was changing in the years before this. And it turns out that from the mid-90s, until about 2005, this whole area was, was going down. Slowly but surely, it was, it was subsiding a little bit. And then in January 2005, it started going up. And it started going up pretty rapidly. It rose about 20 centimeters over the period of about four years. Until 2009, it peaked and then it, and it started sinking back down again. And then from 2014 to 2015, there was a little uptick and then it's been subsiding ever since. So that's interesting, 2009, 
That swarm of local earthquakes in 2009 fits right underneath that peak in ground deformation. And that makes sense. There's a lot of evidence in Yellowstone that, that ground deformation and earthquake swarms are, are coupled and causally related like that. And it really does stand out. It's really tempting to look at this graph and say, look, here we have at the very beginning of our rapid growth phase coincides almost perfectly with the beginning of this rapid rise in the ground. And it certainly is logical to imagine as the ground rises, you're creating space, you're, 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 you're cracking brittle rocks and creating more open spaces for hydrothermal fluids to move around. So, so it certainly is possible. Um, if you look very closely, there's a little bit of a, a time lag between the beginning of this and then the beginning of the rapid growth phase. <clears throat> but um, that's one of the most interesting things about it is that it's not really clear cut. And uh, this may not be very satisfying to you all, but um, it's satisfying to me because it means there are still questions we have yet to answer about this. Uh, the, 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 the growth of this new thermal area does appear to be associated with this ground deformation, but, but it's not totally clear cut. And, and that's where we are right now with this. Um, we, we don't have any information about um, gas emissions, the, the history of gas emissions from this area. And so uh, maybe in the future, we'll, we'll do some more research to figure that out. Um, but in our efforts to understand what's going on here, we, all, we are also trying to understand hazards in the park. And one thing is clear, and there's no question about it, this is a new thermal area that's appeared in the last 20 years, and it's definitely a hazardous area. You, you, you don't want any backcountry hikers to be uh, meandering around this area because this is an area of very hot ground unstable ground. It's possible to be walking along and have your foot break through a crust and end up immersed in, in sort of steam, boiling temperature steam, and you, do, you wouldn't want that. Um, and there are also noxious gases coming out of the ground here, a lot of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide gas coming out of here. And as you can see, it's um, not very friendly to the vegetation. Um, we did get a chance to go out and explore this area last summer, August 2019. And we, we flew out there in a helicopter and were able to acquire some, uh, some images from helicopter and also some thermal infrared camera images, which revealed this, uh, this arc-shaped zone of very, very warm ground where the surface temperature is between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. And uh, just beneath the surface is, is boiling, 93 degrees Celsius. And there were some steaming fumaroles um, that you could see in the area. And we were able to sort of carefully skirt around the edges of it and map out the, the boundary of this area and get a good idea of how big it is. It's about 8.2 acres in size. Um, and to put that in perspective, that's about the size of four soccer fields sort of stuck together. Um, there's no water coming from this area. It's a dry, what we call acid sulfate, steam heated acid sulfate thermal area where the soil is sort of acidic and there's a lot of sulfur crystals forming uh, underneath the fumaroles. One of the interesting things that we observed was um, these dead trees that had fallen down and were in contact with the warm ground were starting to carbonize on the bottom of the tree. They're basically slowly combusting where they were in contact with this really, really hot ground. And in places where these trees were next to a, a gas vent, there were sulfur crystals coating the carbon on the wood, which was pretty amazing to see. Um, and, and another really interesting observation we made is that there's this cool zone that's, that's in the middle of this where there are new trees starting to grow. So there, there are new, less than five-year-old lodgepole pine trees that have started to come back into this area. And so um, may, maybe, it is, maybe it is in the process of cooling down. We will, we will see. Um, but the bottom line here is that, you know, this is what Yellowstone does. Yellowstone is a very dynamic thermal area. What we see at the surface is the expression of this hydrothermal system of fluids moving around underground, which is heated up by magma at depth. And, um, you know, this, 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 is, this is not an indication of magma moving around. This is an indication of hydrothermal fluids moving around. So if anybody's concerned about this being a signal of an impending eruption, it's not. It's just Yellowstone doing what Yellowstone does. Um, and that's, and that's pretty exciting. So what we will do is we will continue to monitor this and look for other areas in the park that may be developing or decaying 
and, and we'll just keep track of how Yellowstone's dynamic hydrothermal system changes over time. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all are as excited as I am about the new discoveries we're making, and stay tuned for more.